With the arrival in Portsmouth of the Royal Navy's ice patrol ship, HMS Endurance, the four members of the British Transarctic Expedition have officially ended their journey, a journey that, both in time and distance, is the longest in polar history. Crowds of well-wishers and relatives gave a warm welcome to these men, undoubtedly grateful for their safe return from what their leader called the only great journey left on Earth. There to greet them officially was the CNC Portsmouth Admiral Sir John Truitt. It's a tremendous honour to the Royal Navy that we've been able to bring you back. And you more or less got used to civilisation through the Navy now, have you? <laughs> <laughs> Let's all go back a bit so we can get you all in and closer together. Uh, uh, come on, laddie, please. The only married man in the team is Dr Fritz Kerner. His little daughter, Eva, was only a week old when he left. One hand is <laughs> like this. You see what I mean? That was six weeks ago. While the United States was preparing to put an astronaut on the moon, these four men had traveled on foot and by dog sledge from one side of the Arctic Ocean to the other. And I think in the case of each man, he requires two things from this journey. He requires a sense of personal achievement and he requires the, or he would like to have, the congratulations of people who really know what they're talking about. In other words, the, uh, the applause of polar men. Triumphant homecoming. From Barrow in Alaska via the North Pole to Spitsbergen, a journey of 3,620 miles. This is the sea they had to cross, hidden beneath a skin of ice that could crack apart or melt into a treacherous drifting slush. There's some times where you can get, get yourself into an area where there's just a complete chaos where everything is moving. Pressure bridges building up and leads opening up. And it's, it can be quite terrifying. The middle of January, 1968. The leader, Wally Herbert, was making final arrangements at Point Barrow, an Eskimo village at the northernmost point of Alaska. In two weeks, it began to start. The expedition was Herbert's own creation. The planning had been his, and the determination to conquer what he himself had described as a horizontal Everest. There are really three things which distinguish this expedition from previous expeditions which have traveled across the polar pack ice. We have radio sets with which we can call up the aircraft support. The radio sets and the aircraft support are really complementary. And we have a knowledge of the ice drift. We're not going to go against the drift of ice the way most previous expeditions did that were attempting the North Pole, but we're going with it by traveling from Point Barrow to Spitsbergen. We're more or less following the example of Nansen in 18, 1897 to 1899. But where we differ from him is that he was stuck in the ice and had to go where it took him. But we can use our knowledge, recent knowledge of the ice drift, to go exactly where we want to go. So these three things, the radio, the aircraft support, and this knowledge of the ice drift which are going to make this expedition possible, these three things don't guarantee success, but they make it more likely. Four weeks before, he had been in London, tying up the loose ends of an operation that had occupied him for nearly five years. As long as he could remember, he had wanted to be a traveler. At the age of three, he was taken to Egypt, at five, to South Africa. At 18, he joined, or rather was put into the army. Well, right back as far as the Harry Hotspur 
Everyone on my father's side had been in the army. I think they were drummer boys or buglers or something. As far as I know, I spent most of the time mucking out horse artillery boxes or blowing Rivali, you know. He had joined his first Antarctic expedition at 20 and hitchhiked back to England through South America. You know, when you come back from the Antarctic, you're quite young and you have the whole, it seems though you have the whole world ahead of you. And you just want to go off and become famous. You have no idea how you're going to going to do that. And I, I suppose at the time you don't have the ability either. Stop. Hey, Al, I'm going to have to um, tell, give them some idea of how much uh, space these dogs are going to take up down inside the aircraft. Um, what's here? We give them about three feet by one feet per dog. Next had come 18 months in the Antarctic with the New Zealanders. But after that, he was stuck. As he said, I couldn't go back to the Antarctic. I didn't want to repeat anything I'd done already. I wanted to do something newer and something bigger. There was little support at first for his trans-Arctic project. Initial backing came from fellow explorers, men like the Bishop of Norwich. As the last trip in, in Greenland last year, we had um, we were on one-fifth of our normal rations for a period Gosh. of a period of six weeks. Six weeks? How did you sort of feel at the end of it? <laughs> Quite bad of a meal? Absolutely. Uh, but it's, it's interesting, though, during this five-week period of mm. very short rations, we went through different stages of, of um, having different kinds of dreams, you know. Mm. I mean, at first we wanted, we wanted meat. We were very hungry for meat. Yes. And then, we, we, after about three weeks, we became hungry for, for, for plum puddings and things. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then, right towards the end, it was, it was quite desperate. We'd, we'd eat anything at yeah. all, and we'd yeah. have the most fantastic dreams. We had very much the... the I, one time when we were down King George's Six Sound, you know, we went we um, went down this mm. trip on the Graham Land expedition, and one morning, Bertram woke up, um, obviously very out of sorts with me, and I didn't quite know what I'd done. And apparently, he'd had a, a dream, and um, the dream was in a sunny vicarage garden in England, you see, and there was an enormous table at the end of the garden with um, a most improbable selection of things like. Um, uh, apple dumplings and so on you see at the end and every time he um, he went to to take one of these just as his hand was on the the thing that he wanted I would clap I was the vicar you see I'd clap my hands and say the choir will now sing <laughs> <laughs> only one member of the team had not been to the Arctic before Major Ken Hedges I think I was a fairly sensitive character at school in some ways I get out and enjoy playing rugger I liked uh, communal activities like this. But some communal pressures I never did appreciate, and obviously there are pressures in a school. I really feel that I have to have an interest in what I was doing to be able to pull the stops out. I was always bottom of the class. That was about the only way in which I was consistent. As a boy, Ken Hedges had wanted an army career. But a bad motor accident at the age of 18 had put paid to his ambition. Instead, he graduated as a doctor and so was able to join the Royal Army Medical Corps. Later, he was seconded to the Special Air Service, which gave him the experience of solitude, of working with only a few companions in inhospitable surroundings. Now, in the august atmosphere of the RMC headquarters, he was given a grim introduction to the Arctic, a final expert briefing on the problems that face a doctor out on the ice. Ah, oh, this is the frostbite. Yeah, well, uh, the great majority of the cases were of the foot. Some of them very bad indeed, like this poor man. He had it on his heel as well. As far as we are concerned, they were all preventable except this poor man who had been wounded and who lay out overnight before he was picked up the next morning, by which time the start of this damage had occurred. Well, thank you very much, sir. sir. What are the chances of this chap keeping his hand, in fact? Would, would they be able to take those fingers, do you think? Not necessarily. You'd have to play that one by ear and uh, treat him for a long, long time indeed. But the, the thing Weeks, is... certainly, and possibly months. It would depend entirely on his treatment. And this is, I think, perhaps I can show you better from uh, one of these photographs here. 
that's an indication that infection has got in. And this is what you will have to try to prevent. Alan Gill was a veteran. He had lived seven years in the polar regions. During his time in London, he couldn't wait to get back. He didn't like big cities. I don't think I'm really antisocial. I can get along very well with, uh, with people in small enough uh, numbers. This is perhaps because I'm not a very assertive sort of personality and, and I can't go throwing my weight around in front of a great big crowd of people. In London, I tend to while away my time, wander around the pubs, have a drink or two, have a meal or two. Always intend to go to shows and go to very few. But generally, I can never settle down. I always consider myself as just passing through. A warehouse in Essex. While everyone else was celebrating Christmas, Alan Gill and the expedition's agent checked through 90,000 pounds of stores. If this expedition failed, it was not going to be for want of preparation. You've got miles and miles of this toilet plate, huh? It's not really, it's a long time, you know. Uh... 16 months. Yes, you need a lot of toilet paper. It's a bit inconvenient when you have to make a quick dash, isn't it? Uh, it can be very, uh, it can be a bit nasty sometimes if you're <laughs> inclement weather. And all the equipment and uh, the clothing you're wearing. Yeah, well, uh, you develop a certain amount of skill in this. There's a technique to it, isn't there? Well, you've got to be fairly quick. And if it's windy weather, then, uh, well, the two schools have sort of thought about this. Some people prefer to face into the wind, mm. and some face downwind. <laughs> I'm an upwind man myself. The end of January, and the return of the sun to Point Barrow. One member of the expedition would not be travelling out onto the ice. Squadron leader Freddie Church, wireless operator. He would sit in this remote hut, a couple of miles down the road from Barrow Village and every day of the next 16 months would keep a regular radio schedule with the expedition, their only link with the outside world. Columbus, Ohio. The expedition was due to leave on February 1st, but there was one man who had still to arrive at Point Barrow, Dr. Fritz Kerner, the team's glaciologist. His wife, Anna, was expecting their first child in a few days' time. Kerner was to join the others as soon as he could. It's only as I come towards the time of leaving on the expedition that I realise more and more what it means for Anna. And now she says, OK, if you really want to go that much, I won't stop you. And it's a long time, you know. And for me, it's great actually doing things. But for Anna, on her own here, it's almost like a year and a, a third blank in her life. And this, this does worry, worry me somewhat. Certainly, Fritz Kerner had to face a lot of criticism, especially from some of his scientific colleagues. No, I, I really just can't see any justification for it at all, scientifically. Yeah, yeah, you're supposed to be a scientist. Yeah, but why shouldn't a scientist um, go on other ventures, let's put it that way? OK, as, as long as you don't pretend that there's any science in it. Well, no, there is some, but I, I wouldn't pretend that the main motive is scientific. Why, for, why, for example, do, do some scientists want to climb mountains even when they don't? I know it's not for 16 months. It will be for a shorter period of time, but... I mean, they can only justify it on the fact that they like climbing mountains. And they like to be the first to climb a particular mountain or something like that. But, OK, I mean, in that case, everything leads up to one final, one final event. Whereas your, whereas your trek across the, the Arctic is going to be 16 months of boredom. February, and Herbert goes to look at the ice ahead. Between the coast and the solid polar pack was a treacherous belt of mush ice. At that time, it was wide open and impassable. I haven't liked to cross it at all. It's, I had a good look at it. And in fact, in some cases, the pilots came down with the two systems we were flying in, down to about uh, three or four feet above the pack ice. And it looked pretty bad from down there. So there was no hope of leaving on time 
and no knowing when the ice would close up and let them through. In the Eskimo village of Barrow, the expedition was the big talking point. The older men, the experts, were pessimistic. All their lives they had lived with the ice, and they knew what a savage enemy it could be. Nowadays, though, Barrow had many of the characteristics of any small American township, and the teenagers that gathered at Kitty's place were more curious than impressed by the folly of these four strange Englishmen. Young boys still went hunting with their fathers, but it was for pleasure rather than any struggle for survival. But hey, it feels so Although a new generation looked south, towards the United States, they were still a people close enough to their environment to know its dangers. Like the owner of this store, for years a hunter himself. With real estate in Los Angeles, Tom Brower was now one of the world's most incongruous billionaires. He asked me what chances he had uh, on the west side of Barrow, and I said that is uh, an area where most native people would call uh, and a spot of no return. February the 5th, the days slipped by. The team was still at Point Barrow, Fritz Kerner had still to arrive, and a fresh southerly wind had cracked open the coastal ice again. In Al's cafe, the older people talked about the problems of this coastal ice. If only a wind would blow from the north, it would pack the mush ice tight against the coast. But as Sadie Neacock, Barrow's chief magistrate, explained, that can change overnight. It's very dangerous out there. Right. Sometimes yeah. the men folks will, can lose their whale head. <coughs> it goes under the ice, and then you have to run for your life. If you ever see them on young ice, you know, when they're whaling, that young form ice, even in April, it's, it's, you can see the waves following this young ice, the, the waves, the, how they run this young ice. But not, not uh, fresh ice, fresh ice like a glass, break right out. But sea ice hold you up more, flexible, just like a plastic. The night of February the 9th. With a temperature of 80 below freezing, Fritz Kerner arrived at Barrow Airport. Yesterday, he had said goodbye to his wife and his three-day-old daughter, Eva. The expedition was now complete. Now it was just a question of the ice and choosing the moment to go, balancing the odds and hoping the wind would change. Where's your kit? When did the sun come back? <laughs> Before they went, the Eskimos threw a party for the four men. In honor of their guests, they performed a traditional dance, the dance of the polar bear. changed, and from the air, the ice looked firm. This was the moment for which Wally Herbert had been waiting, planning, arguing, 
for four and a half years. I've been on many journeys before, but you never quite lose that feeling. You can do it many, many times, and you never quite lose it. I think this time it's just that, that much more powerful, poignant. Because this time, it's, it's my own expedition. It's taken a long, long time to get ready, get going. There have been so many obstacles. And also because it's the longest journey I've ever made. And I think probably the most difficult one I shall ever make. This, in fact, was the beginning of what was to be the longest sustained journey in the history of polar exploration. It was February 21st, 1968. I think that the appeal of this trip is, in every sense of the word, the bigness of it. The bigness of it just in time, and the bigness of it in distance, and the bigness of it as a challenge, a challenge of, of human endurance. We're four individual people with varying backgrounds and different ideas and ideals. If one does have an argument, and I should say this is inevitable, one mustn't allow oneself to bear grudges. I certainly don't find the loneliness of, of polar places frightening. In fact, this is one of the things I like about it. In civilization, there's more things to worry one, whereas in the polar regions, there's, for me, there's fewer personal problems. All these worries are sloughed off, and you've got the straightforward ones of... They're physical, they're all physical obstacles. They're, Either the weather's bad or it's good or you can travel or you can't travel. No doubt at all with me now, it's a form of escapism. At first the going was good, but before they could reach the polar pack, they had to cross their first real obstacle, the mush ice belt. The environment itself is frightening, but at the same time, very, very exciting. And I find that it's possible to be excited by it to the point where you're saturated by the excitement. And then from that moment on, you can be completely unemotional, unaffected by it. And this is quite a stimulating feeling. It's, it's almost like being sort of drunk with, with, with your own power. A few days out, it was still hard work disciplining the dogs. As they approached the mush ice, perhaps they remembered the stories they'd been told by the Eskimo hunters in Barrow. We came to the end of this stretch, which has taken us about 35 miles due east of Barrow. We had to turn north at some point. We knew this. So we climbed a pretty high pressure ridge and had a look. Ahead of us, it was just a complete chaos of ice. I'd never seen anything like it before in my life. A mass of, of wet, jumbled ice, which wouldn't bear the weight of a man. The whole thing was moving. We had to wait until it quietened down. It was the only chance we'd have of getting across it. There was no escape from this sort of cold. Touch bare metal, and you burned your fingers. Face the wind, and the white, dead patches appeared on your cheeks and nose. How's that dog? The only refuge was your tent. A tiny roar of flame from the primus, your means of survival. Oh, yes. Even then, frost and ice formed everywhere, your breath creating a hard crust around the mouth of your sleeping bag. Oh, gorgeous. Gorgeous. Did a good job on this camera. <laughs> Do you want some more sugar? No, it's just fine. It's just fine. Eventually, the expedition ventured out onto the mush ice negotiating their way through a fragmented wilderness. But one night settled down like this. What they'd most feared happened. The first thing I remember is that, that Fritz shouted out, 
You're going to have to move and move quick. I, I, I couldn't believe him. I thought he was just pulling our leg. It was pitch dark outside. You couldn't see anything at all, but once you got outside the tent, you could hear the noise of this pressure ridge. And sure enough, it did seem pretty close. From London, it looked as if this was the end of the expedition. We literally threw everything on the sledges and, and, and drove the dogs off into the night. But the trouble was, we, we, we didn't know where to escape to. It, uh, the pressure noises seemed as though they were all around us. Eventually, they reached safe ice. The four men had survived their first ordeal. It wasn't until we were well clear of the mush ice that we got into a, a rhythm, a simple, basic rhythm, where you travel hard until you feel tired. Then you stop and you have a meal and you go to sleep. Your day is divided into these three sensations, three very basic needs. The need to have exercise, the need to work hard, the need to sleep and the need to eat. I think it was the very simplicity of this that made it so satisfying. During this 16-month journey, I think, quite obviously, the thing I most miss is uh, will be sex. It's probably about the only thing I really miss. And I've been so used to missing it that uh, I almost got used to the idea. I think it will be difficult to adjust at the end of the trip. And this is something that Anna and I worry about a little bit, that you can't go away for 16 months and come back and take up where you left off. It was now the month of March. Day by day, the sun rose higher. With the ice still hard and the days longer, this was a time for good, hard sledging. But as it turned out, there was no clear dividing line between the mush ice belt and the firmer polar pack. It was going to be difficult to reach their intended destination, the pole of inaccessibility, before the summer melts began. We'd expected to be clear of the mush ice and onto the solid polar pack after about 100 miles. But we were a bit disappointed that it didn't work out like that. For I, I suppose about the first 200 miles of the journey we were traveling across the thin ice. Good boy, good. The problem is you can't travel in a straight line on the Arctic Ocean. You have to make too many detours to get around leads and pressure ridges. And then the, the ice is drifting all the time. You don't know how much is drifting or in which direction. So really the only way you can find out where you are is by doing a, a navigational fix. It was not only to know where they were going. Unlike the Antarctic, you couldn't lay supply depots in advance, not on a constantly shifting skin of sea ice. So for a journey of this distance, you needed airdrops. To find two small tents in an area of something like 3,000 square miles of, of drifting pack ice where you have a, a tracery of shadows much longer than the tents would cast. You have to be able to at least give the aircraft a pretty good fix. Their first two airdrops were done by the American Navy. We would stand outside and listen for the aircraft engines and call them into our position. But the whole basis of this was that we had at least initially to be able to tell them exactly where we were. A criticism of the expedition had been their reliance on airdrops. A journey of this distance and this duration wouldn't be possible without airdrops. You couldn't carry sufficient food to last for 16 months. Now, if you were attempting a journey to the pole and back along the same route, you could possibly do this with uh, 
a massive support party of Eskimos. But when you go beyond the pole, then you're way out on a limb. Bonus for the dogs. Walrus meat purchased from the Eskimos in Barrow. We just weren't too sure that the dog pemmican was going to be adequate for the dogs over a period of uh, 16 months. So to make quite sure that they were kept up in fairly reasonable uh, physical shape, every opportunity we had, we would feed them on fresh meat. Now well into April, they were falling badly behind schedule. They had not anticipated quite so much broken ice. Even two or three hundred miles out on the pair of pack ice, we are so seldom ever able to travel more than two miles without meeting a major pressure ridge. three hours chopping away through this and then after about another 20 minutes there'll be another white line on the horizon another pressure ridge another major hack possibly one which would take two or three days to get across the month of may on the arctic ocean is the month of mists you follow your dogs over hummocks you can't see and fall into holes which are invisible Now is the time for the ice to loosen up and for leads to appear. They were averaging only two or three miles a day. There's really only one time of the year when it's worth the trouble to convert a sledge into a boat in order to cross a lead. So a period of about two or three weeks when the leads are not freezing over and where there's still enough ice on the other side of the lead to make it worthwhile crossing in order to get some more traveling. Our first venture at boating was a bit of a disaster. We managed to get across the lead okay and devised a much quicker way of getting back. We had a rope which went from the boat to the shore from which we'd come and our two companions gave us a tow but they towed it a little bit too quick and they the boat uh, sank. It was a heck of a job getting it out. In fact, we had to fish around for several hours before we were able to uh, get all the boxes out. Most of the gear, of course, was ruined. The sun circled constantly above them now. All around, the ice was melting. But by midsummer's day, it was getting very wet. You'd go through to your knees in deep snow, and at the bottom of that would be slush and then each day from then on the water level got higher till eventually there was more water than snow it was not until july the fourth that we found a flow big enough and safe enough to sit out the summer melt by that time the flows were flooded in water so they called in their summer airdrop this time supplied by the royal canadian air force out of parachutes we built ourselves a tent, and in this we improvised some tables and chairs and out of packing crates. What I remember most vividly about the summer camp was the very first day we woke up that morning, and for the first time since leaving Barrow, we, we felt that we didn't have to go anywhere. But there was still work to do. Well, Ken had a program of clothing research. We had, first of all, to plunge a naked foot into a great tub of cold water and to see how much water it displaced and then to put on that naked foot a sock or two socks and then eventually a boot and so on. And this rather bizarre experiment occupied uh, all four of us for about four or five days. Ken Hedges had one or two other tricks up his sleeve, such as going for an Arctic swim.
His excuse was that Fritz Kerner needed some underwater photographs. Wearing a wetsuit, you can stay in for anything up to 25 minutes. And Ken, being a qualified SAS diver, uh, wearing a wetsuit, he was able to dive down to about 10 feet and get some pictures of the uh, underside of the sea ice for Fritz. But it's a very risky operation because you could quite easily be um, sucked by a current underneath the ice and perhaps not find your way out again. So on the first occasion, we had him tied to a safety line just in case this happened. occasions when I was able to to take off and go hunting. The summer proved to be a very busy period. We didn't hunt for the sport of it, we hunted to feed the dogs. And in some cases, we had to shoot in order to protect the dogs. I remember one occasion when a polar bear came right into the camp after them. In fact, uh, he came far too close to the dogs for comfort. I think in retrospect, we ought to have shot him. Before he got within striking range of the dogs, he could quite easily have killed them. The summer was nearly over. Setting off for their autumn sledging, they'd hoped to be nearly at the pole before winter. But now they were to suffer the biggest setback of the whole journey. Alan Gill, running by the side of his sledge, fell. The injury proved to be a slipped disc. The others pulled the tent down around him and used a dinghy to cushion his back. Well, Ken's immediate prognosis was that he should be sent out. This was the only safe way, or the only way that, that we could be sure that Alan would get the best possible treatment. I think for me, Alan's accident was the lowest point of the expedition. To think that he was going to have to leave the expedition at this time, right at the beginning of the winter, it was a blow which I just couldn't really take. Their autumn journey should have taken them to a position that would have allowed their winter hut to drift across the North Pole. Now they were returning to their summer camp. September. At Resolute Bay in northern Canada, the Canadian Air Force was preparing to fly out the expedition's big winter airdrop. There was little light left in the sky. In a couple of weeks, the polar night would have begun. While the Canadians were worried that they might have missed their chance, there was anxiety in London too. They wanted to get Alan Gill off the ice before winter. But Gill wanted to stay and Herbert supported him, contending he could rest up during the winter. Major Hedges, the expedition's doctor, didn't. He argued that he'd get better treatment back home. The management committee in London backed Hedges and sent a directive to Herbert. Neither the committee nor the press could know how much personal conflict there was between the four men on the ice. What they did know soon enough was Herbert's explosive reaction to the committee's directive. Quoted on the front page of the Times, he said, the committee are getting completely carried away with themselves, sending directives when they should be sending recommendations. They just don't know what the bloody hell they're talking about. The committee's response was equally pointed. Policy was one thing, practicalities another. It was unlikely a rescue plane could have landed. Locating them was difficult enough. This was a vital supply drop. The supply drop 
We shall provide us with sufficient food, fuel, and equipment to last right through the winter. It was quite an experience to see all these boxes raining down on us. Boxes which I helped to pack in London. Boxes which have been handled by the Royal Air Force and the US Navy, the Danes, the Norwegians, the Canadians. In fact, I felt I couldn't really put the Union Jack up. I hid it on this occasion because I felt, I think rightly, that this was an international operation. The hut we used once already. We spent the winter in it in, in northwest Greenland as part of our training program. We erected it and taken it down again. And so, when eventually we unpacked it on the ice, we were quite familiar with how to put it up, and we got it up in just a few hours. In fact, it wasn't really a hut at all, it was a padded tent. And it was a very warm, cozy winter quarters it proved to be. As they made themselves comfortable, there was one attempt to reach them. The BBC and the Sunday Times flew out to try and interview the expedition on the ice. They got as far as an American naval research station called T3. It was situated on a drifting iceberg 100 miles away. But the ice around the expedition broke up and made a landing impossible. All they could do was interview Herbert by radio. Ideally, we should uh, should have been by, by now about uh, 87 degrees and on the other side of the date line. But well, that puts us, I suppose, well, I'm just guessing here a little bit, uh, maybe about 250 miles or so behind schedule. Thinking now of the future, Wally, I believe you plan to start in March. Is it going to be dark at that time? It depends a little bit on the latitude. If we're at latitude 87, which is what I hope... Well, well, then it should be, uh, should be pretty strong twilight by the 1st of March. After talking to Richard Taylor of the BBC, Herbert was questioned by Peter Dunn of the Sunday Times. Does this mean that uh, Alan's going to stay for the whole trip now? Um, and what's Ken's attitude to this? Over. Well, the thing is, of course, that uh, we were trying to get Alan out on the first available opportunity. And the first available opportunity, uh, in, in fact, was well his landing, or, or possible landing. And now this doesn't look as if it's going to be possible. So uh, Alan has no choice but to stay on. So that it was. The argument, if not the problem, had been resolved by the Arctic weather. Cocooned in their hut, now the expedition hoped to drift northwards during their five months of darkness. I decided that this period must be packed full of work. It was a very good opportunity for Alan to recuperate. But at the same time, being the sort of person he is, we didn't really expect him to lie on his bed for very long. And in fact, he, he slept outside the whole winter. So Alan developed a technique because of his slip disc. Uh, he, instead of lifting things, would push them. All four took their turn at cooking. The cooking was as distinctive as, as were the four characters. I mean, for instance, Alan's cooking was pretty rough. But he tried hard. Fritz was, was a little less basic. He tried to put a few fancy touches, but was a little bit embarrassed about this. Ken didn't like cooking. It was quite a long time before he really got stuck into it. The main criticism that they put against my cooking was that it was far too decorative and didn't taste very nice. <laughs> but they had to admit it was decorative. Suddenly, one night, the flow on which they'd built their hut cracked open. The split occurred about 25 yards from the hut, just a little bit too close for comfort. And we just dare not stay there. We, by that time, it was dark. And trying to find an alternative campsite was not an easy, easy job. We eventually found a spot about three miles away. And then, of course, had to shift all 28 tons of food, fuel, and equipment and the hut over to this new site. <laughs> By Christmas, we got ourselves pretty comfortably established and got a routine going. For a Christmas lunch, we had 
three uh, very small chickens, which really, well, I'm not too sure whether they were chickens. But we took a lot of trouble over this and made several cakes and spent, in fact, quite a while making a, a fancy Christmas nosh. The spirit ration and the beer ration, of course, was limited because the bulk of it was quite a problem. In any case, I felt that the Arctic Ocean is not the best place to get drunk. You can make a few mistakes if you go outside in an inebriated state. The, uh, the basic chore of survival, in fact, took up a quarter of our entire winter period for each man repairing building the sledges, making harnesses for the dogs and traces and whips and pottering jobs, as we used to call them. technique of whip making we picked up from the Eskimos along with many other very useful little hints during our winter in Greenland as part of the training program for this trip. We'd have to go outside several times a day just to check the flow and make sure that we weren't uh, getting cut off from our dogs or from our supplies. Just shortly after Christmas there was a very active pressure bridge which built up in fact, an active fracture zone. And we'd sort of go across just to check it out, make sure there wasn't uh, no splits coming off at right angles, which might go straight through the hut. And it became, after a while, a fairly familiar noise. Each one of us had our own special jobs to do during the winter time. Ellen was principally responsible for the, the recharging of the batteries the, and the navigation. The navigation is a, a particularly unpleasant chore in the winter time. You have to spend possibly half an hour or three quarters of an hour outside peering through this instrument, trying to pick up a few stars in temperatures of about minus 45 Fahrenheit. He did this every day, sometimes twice a day during the whole winter drift. For Ken's psychological program, we had to answer several thousands of what seemed at the time pretty absurd questions, such as, is your sex life satisfactory? Fritz's program was really a continuation of what he started in the summer, the program of mic micrometeorological work, a detailed study of a climate in a small environment. My own program, of course, was mostly writing. I would say a good half of my work in the wintertime was, uh, was writing to and receiving messages from the committee. Uh, a lot of these were in code or in cipher. And they were apropos of our journey the following spring. Should Alan, or sh should Alan go out, or should he stay with us, or how were we going to get to Spitsbergen? And of course, the answers to most of these things I didn't know myself at that time. Traction, 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 six five four four. How do you read? Possibly the, the static period for Fritz would have been very difficult to take as a married man. Unless he'd occupied himself as fully as he did, he was probably by far the most stable of the, the four of us because he had someone thinking about him or someone with whom he knew that in a year's time or six months' time he'd be able to share these experiences. His little daughter Eva was now a year old. In most of the messages that and I sent to Fritz radio messages anyway. She seemed fairly cheerful. There were one or two periods, sure enough, when she wished that Fritz was back at home, particularly, I think, the, the Christmas period and at various stages in the development of, of Eva, their daughter. It was time now, though, to prepare for their second year's travel. That first hint in the sky of the returning sun was quite exciting. But at the same time, it was in some ways worrying because we were at that time latitude 85, 30. We were almost five degrees of latitude from the pole. That's about 300 nautical miles. Heck of a long way. The morning of their departure, the flow split open yet again, this time right by the hut. It was a complete shambles that day we left. It wasn't really 
a departure at all. It was an escape. The floor had just, just cracked up like an eggshell. But they got away safely. Their objective now was the Pearl. A lot of people, even some of our friends, said we'd never make it to the North Pole, not let alone to Spitsbergen. Only three people had ever reached the North Pole before, all three Americans. For Robert E. Peary, it was the culmination of a lifelong ambition. But when he succeeded and returned home, another man, Dr. Frederick Cook, had already claimed he got there a year earlier. Fifty years later, the controversy still continues. The only uncontested attainment of the pole was last year when Ralph Plaisted led a motorized expedition. They traveled out by skidoo and came back by plane. Approaching the North Pole is, is a rather unique experience. You, you, you're approaching the point on the Earth's surface where all the lines of longitude converge, and this is a very confusing place to be. It became a problem of rather like trying to step on the shadow of a bird which is hovering overhead, because the ice itself is moving. Traveling back and forth, taking fixes on their position. It was 15 hours before they could say accurately they were at the North Pole. It was April the 6th. 1969. Because Scott and his men posed in a certain way and Amundsen in a certain way, and because of our consciousness of history, we were more or less obliged to pose in the same way. But by this time, we were feeling pretty cold, and we weren't too sure of the exposure. So I remember taking 36 pictures at the North Pole on every different exposure setting on the camera. Meanwhile, my colleagues were getting pretty bored and fed up with this. And the, the actual pose itself, well, I don't know. I think we and everybody else would have been disappointed if we posed in any other way. Now came the last leg of the journey, the dash for Spitsbergen. Others had reached the pole, but no one had gone the whole way across the Arctic Ocean. They were nearly a month behind schedule. They could only make it with forced marches. For the next few weeks, they traveled 15 hours a day. For the first time, in something like 14 months. We were heading in a different direction to north. We got the sense that we were heading for home at last. We were heading straight down the zero meridian. You can't aim much more precisely for London than that. I'd computed at which distance from land at which we should make our first sighting. And so we had a pretty good idea of on what, on what day we would make our first sighting, providing, of course, the visibility was good. And sure enough, on that day, on the horizon at about 8.30 in the morning, we saw clouds which could only, only have been land clouds. But you couldn't make out land until quite a bit later on in the day. Then there was no mistaking it. You could see it clear enough. It was a tremendous, a tremendous feeling. But at the same time, we were still quite a distance from it. And it wasn't until we got to within about seven miles of land that it really seemed to stand out. And I remember crossing the very last pressure ridge, or at least it seemed to be the last one. And once over this, we found ourselves on a flat stretch of ice which seemed to go right up to the, right up to the land itself. In fact, it was, it was so flat that Fritz and I were able to run the two teams parallel to each other side by side. For about three miles, we just sat there chatting to each other. And that, I think, was probably the finest moment of the whole expedition. Because we were quite sure we were going to make it, you know. I think probably that was the first time in the expedition that we really felt we would, too. But then, three miles from land, everything stopped. And there was a pressure ridge, and beyond that, a mush ice belt, and beyond that, open water. And there was not a chance of getting onto it. Not a hope. On May 27th, the Royal Navy's ice patrol ship, HMS Endurance, entered the sea ice just north of Spitsbergen. Their instructions were to lift off the expedition if it should prove impossible to carry out their intended plan of reaching the main island and traveling overland to the small mining village of Longyearbyen. By May 28th, any hope of that seemed slight. 
they were just 200 yards from land. But it was 200 yards of unnegotiable mush ice. So we were pretty depressed and we camped that night, quite expecting to drift about four or five miles overnight away from the island. In fact, that night I radioed Captain Buchanan on the Endurance saying that the chances were that it would be two or three weeks before we could make a landing. Well, little did we know that there was an eddy that held the ice in tight to little Blackboard Island. And the following morning when we awoke, we found we were in exactly the same position and had one more chance of getting ashore. The following morning, Herbert called up the Endurance by radio. Endurance, 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 traction, 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 six, five, four, four. Traction, traction, traction. This is endurance, endurance, endurance. Endurance, endurance, traction, traction, traction. Something had happened. This was obviously no normal schedule, as Herbert was sending his messages in code. Four, zero, four, six, zero, one, nine, At 1900 hours, GMT, 29th May. A landing was made by Ellen Gill and Major Ken Hedges, RAMC, on a small, rocky island at latitude 80, 49 north, Longitude 2023 20, East, after a scramble across three quarters of a mile of mush ice and gyrating ice pans. This landing, though brief, concluded the first surface crossing of the Arctic Ocean. A journey of 3,620 route miles from Point Barrow, Alaska, via the North Pole. The four members of the crossing party, on their 464th day on drifting ice, are now heading southwest across broken ice pack towards a rendezvous with HMS Endurance. Although, as Herbert described it, it was all a bit of a scramble, they'd made it. They were faced now with a new problem, how to reach the Endurance. Good lead ahead, Chris, just under the water sky. Port 20. But there was no great danger. It was just a matter of time. I think it's very unlikely that I would ever make a journey of this length again. Because this, this was the biggest thing that, that, that we could do. This journey coincided with that time in a man's life when you have to make a big journey. Is in a few years' time, I think. I should be too old for this. It's not the sort of trip, trip I would recommend for fun, at least not this long. If one was asked again to come on a trip like this, I would have to have very good reasons for saying yes. But I would also probably give myself very good reasons for saying no, too. I think if, uh, if the opportunity arose for a similar sort of trip, I could... If it was good enough, I could possibly be tempted to uh, to try to to have another go. But it's a little bit soon after this one yet, just to decide how I feel about those things. But I'm pretty sure I could be tempted. I would never do a trip of this length and type again. Partly from because I'm a married man, but also because I don't think it's a thing I would want to do again, even if I was single because I would fear that I was just playing if I did it again. I had a very open mind when I began the journey. I really didn't know what to expect. I had rather vague ideas going back to the historic and romantic times of Shackleton and Scott. Uh, it didn't turn out at all like that. It was very different. The difference between our expedition and the old ones is that I don't think at any stage were we in danger of our lives? I'm sure we never felt as isolated as people like Nansen. Danger is a very relative thing. Certainly it was very dangerous at the beginning of the journey, but it was dangerous then because we didn't know what we were doing. But then you see later on in the journey, we became familiar with this kind of country. What's the ice like over there, Ever? Uh, 
so the chances of the expedition sledging right up to the ship are slight. It's a question now of getting near enough to be lifted off. As soon as I get back, I'll have to discuss with Anna which of two jobs to take. I'm going to leave it with her as far as possible as to which one to choose. I think if I have any plans for the future, it mu they must be plans which are along a different line. I don't think that I can stick with the same profession. One doesn't climb Mount Everest and then uh, be satisfied with climbing Snowden. My next move, I think, will be a bit of a rest, a bit of a holiday, a bit of loafing around. And although I haven't got anything definitely set up yet, I shall almost certainly find myself back in the polar regions, either north or south. I, I think the trip has changed my sense of values. Now, coming out of this expedition with that change of heart, if you like, is obviously going to be reflected in what one does afterwards. And the alternative to remaining within the medical corps is to work in an area perhaps where there's a greater need for doctors, where there are very few doctors and very many patients. I think perhaps one of these days I, I might get married, I don't know. And it'll probably have to be a rather unusual sort of woman who'll be keen on the idea anyway. Perhaps the sort of woman I'd be able to cart away to some godforsaken corner of the world and uh, she'd enjoy it as much as me. They'd probably rather have to come by. Port 20, full ahead. Certainly the weeks of slow progress provides a lively topic for argument in the wardroom. If you cross the pole using decent modern equipment, mechanical equipment, and planned it as a big expedition, the value to humanity would be far greater. The moment all is achieved, I reckon, is walking across the North Pole on the longest I, 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 I admire Wally Herbert and his team far more than the two Pongos who rode across the Atlantic no. the other day. Well, well, I, I, well, well, I know, I'm not with it, but I think it was a yeah, very much a greater achievement and has considerably more value for humanity in general. I think undoubtedly the lowest point on the journey for me personally was when Alan Gill injured his back because Alan, after all, was a very old friend of mine. I'd been with him on many long journeys. I didn't feel that I could complete this journey without his companionship. I think if this so-called rescue plane had got in, obviously I'd have been most reluctant to go. But I think I probably should have had to go. The occasion, fortunately, never arose. I might even have done something nasty like sneaking away and hiding somewhere. Who knows? You can... You're not going to get four ordinary men wanting to go on a journey like this. They must be individuals. They must be well-developed characters. And so, therefore, they must have different motives. I think probably all four of us had uh, different motives to some extent. Uh, Wally, for instance, he likes to place it in its historic context. And to him, I think it's a little bit more than just a, a private adventure. In my case, it's a purely personal thing. It's like climbing a mountain. I was just uh, doing the trip. To towards the end of the trip, if I wasn't leading, and you know, I was watching the others lead, I felt that we were a bunch of children, you know, playing a game. And it was like I was in a reserve looking from outside and thinking, well, well, this is stupid. Some of my scientific colleagues had, may have had this very attitude. At times, there was loneliness. Um, not loneliness of just a few people, but loneliness of being the only Christian in a group. And, and I'm rather soft with animals, and one thing I used to hate to have to do, or to see done, was to leave a, leave a trail of carnage of polar bear or their young behind. And believe me, we really did find this necessary. We tried all sorts of means short of letting the dogs off at them to frighten them away, and sometimes they would be frightened away. But on a couple of occasions, the mother, the hungry mother, would come forward and keep coming at us. And we, to save our lives, we'd just have to drop her. Finally, the expedition are close enough to be lifted off the ice. They set up camp for the last time.
Captain Peter Buchanan of HMS Endurance, arrives to greet the four men who, for 16 months, have seen no other living soul. Well, champagne. Yeah, well, I, I didn't think much of that idea, I must say. Uh, it would have been... Uh, puns like champagne on ice and yeah, so on. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure it's better to... Uh, I've got a... Uh, I must give you the message from your father, which he said, he says your very best congratulations on a tremendous achievement. From you and your uh, your father and your family. I'm glad you kept it actually because I yeah. I regard this as the end of the yeah. journey. I've looked at the the ice conditions around here. They're not they're not easy between here and the and the oh, ship. Yeah. I was pretty horrified yesterday when I came past it. Yeah. Yes. I think it just gradually gets worse and worse as one gets uh, down towards the coast. Well, I'm not going to stay. Uh, <laughs> I'll leave you to get on with it, Wally. Yeah, all right. But if I could just shake the others by the hand. Sir Alan, great to meet you. Too. Looking forward to having you on board. Yeah, and Fitzgerald. Uh, one of uh, the officers saw Anna in Portsmouth. Oh, he did. And uh, she was looking very fit and sends you her love. And uh, looking forward to seeing you. Yeah. Ken? Ken Hedges. Hey, Ken. Very nice, very nice to have you on board. Thank you, you very much. It really is tremendous to meet you. Very great. The last 10 minutes of the expedition were very, very emotional because my companions had all been snatched away by the helicopters and my sledge had been snatched away. It had just been picked up and carried off and I was just left on the ice with just one team of dogs. It gradually came back again and then from that moment everything was noisy chaotic and the dogs were bundled on on the helicopter and we took off and then as we came in and settled on the flight deck of the endurance i had first of all to get all the dogs out of the out of the helicopter and immediately in front of me in the in the hangar oh, I, there just seemed to be thousands of people and they're all friendly people they weren't shouting or cheering or anything, but uh, they sort of uh, swallowed me up. You know. Everyone was speaking, but I didn't hear anything. But when did you first start planning this expedition? Oh, about the um, beginning of 64. And then and I was, uh, was flakers. He pulled a muscle in, in his uh, buttock. While I was having the haircut, it was difficult to stay awake. Then I was invited along to, uh, to Whitehall to discuss it. This spring, for example, it was almost impossible. <laughs> and then as soon as my haircut was finished, I came up and lay on the bed. And the next thing I knew, I was being woken up. So, that's how it ended. In a week's time, they would be in Portsmouth. It had been my dream for almost five years that I would have made a landing on the north shore of Spitsbergen. And this now is passing me on my left. I think I always have some regrets that I didn't make a landing there and climb up over the ice cap and down to Sassen Fjord. I'm sure I'm going to be asked many times with what emotion we made our first sighting of land. The pack ice environment had to us in 15 months become familiar. We'd grown accustomed to the sounds and the sight of the drifting ice and had developed habits of survival which required no conscious thought. The, the adventure was no longer the novel situation, but the journey as a whole. And its climax, not the, not the sight of land, but the sight from land of the ice across which we'd come.